I apologize for troubling you to come here, but we have something we wanted to show you right away. This is it. We've replicated the aura of that boy you brought in. It bears no resemblance to anything we've ever seen. Something to do with his contact with number 26, or it might... Have you begun the comparison with the Akira pattern? We're just about ready now. This is only a projection based on our collective data. It's difficult to compare, but the aura of this boy might be a clue towards untangling the mystery of Akira. Good. Keep it. Hey, panelers, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. I'm Laura. And I'm Rob. And it's been a long time since we actually had a podcast come out. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming back and listening to us. This episode of the podcast, we're going to be covering Akira from 1988, which is a Japanese animated film. Uh, It's highly regarded. A lot of people love it. Uh, I know that Rob loves it, I love it, and uh, Lara loves it. It's one of those strange movies that came out of nowhere by 1988. And it pretty much stems from the manga element that was out there in in Japan from manga comics. I'm not sure exactly you guys could correct me or not. This was a manga comic at one point, correct? Yes. Correct. As a matter of fact, it's uh, here's the interesting thing about it. It's a manga that somehow was finished after the movie came out <laughs> after <laughs> yeah so the mo- so if you think about it so the manga started then they somehow you know halfway through they started doing the movie and then somehow the movie influenced the ending of the ma- the manga <laughs> oh i so you could, that's crazy when did yeah, the manga so- complete uh, was I think it, it was in 1990, 1990, 91, something like that. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. And it, it premiered in uh, its release date actually was July 16, 1988. The budget was 700 million yen, which boils down to $5.7 million. And the box office was 49 million on the take. So it didn't do well in comparison to what we would say uh, on in the United States, but uh, it has grown a cult following over the years, and a lot of people do enjoy it. Uh, it was distributed by Toho, which uh, a lot of you know. I'm a huge Godzilla fan, but Toho is the uh, film company that had distributed this film and created this film. There's a, a ton of people on here that I would probably destroy their names if I had gone through them, whether it be produced by, but it's based upon Akira by Katsuhiro Otomo. And uh, it's his comic through manga, like uh, Rob had just mentioned, uh, directed by Katsuhiro Otomo himself and screened by Katsuhiro Katsuhiro Otomo and Izu Hashimoto. Yeah, like I said, I'm destroying these names. Kind of like when Daphne and I were doing uh, Battle Royale for Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. (laughs) We just kept going on and on and on. But yeah, it's a true Japanese film. I recently watched it twice in the dubbed version. I watched it once before I watched it twice on the dubbed version, but I watched it once with the uh, (laughs) the subtitles. There is a differentiation between the, uh, the text and the dialogue that we get from the English version that's dubbed. So uh, keep that in mind when you watch it. So choose your, uh, choose your path, as I would say, (laughs) you know, which do you choose the blue pill or the red pill? Have fun with that, that you could find it on 4k Blu-ray and regular Blu-ray because they reissued these within the past year. If you could find the media content that's out there, because, Rob, as you and I both are aware and are fans of physical media, physical media is going away. Well, in some places. Uh, you can still get it in, on Amazon. And... It's streaming on Hulu. That's where I watched it. Oh, cool. But I noticed that 
Walmart is still selling. Yes. You know, so I was looking at like steel books the other day through Walmart, which I never <laughs> shop in Walmart, but I was like, well, I guess I have to now. <laughs> yeah, I actually recently did that too with a steel book, but uh, Rob will yell at me or laugh at me for buying it. It was the Marvels. <laughs> I got that on steel book, unfortunately. The Marvel? Wait, you got the last one? The last Marvels that came out? Yeah. Oh, from where? From Walmart. Huh. They had because it on. I you, you can pre-order it. <laughs> yeah, because I l- look as bad as that movie was. <laughs> I have the steel book of every Marvel's, you know, MCU movie that came out. Yeah, and for me to stop is because it's only because I'm collecting them, not because the movie was great. So that's the only reason I would get it. Like if I could <laughs> okay. just if I could just buy the steel book and not the movie, sure. <laughs> Are those the movies that have the like metallic covers on them? Correct. Okay. My daughter just got like five or six of those for Christmas with all the Hayao Miyazaki movies on them. Well, oh, not all nice. of them, but a good amount of them. Yeah, that was actually a good collection they made. I didn't get it because it was not in 4K. Mm. But if it was in 4K, I would have had the whole thing. I actually have like in my collection, I think right now, like, I don't know, two or three hundred steel books. <laughs> I don't want to be the one who has to dust those. <laughs> uh, well, they're in boxes right now. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be the one lifting those when he has to move into his new house, Lara. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yes. I had a friend of mine lift a few a few boxes and he was like, what are in this? And it's like movies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh I think we kind of digressed a little bit, but it's pretty fun uh, that we're actually going to be talking about this. Obviously, everybody, Akira 1988. We do have a synopsis, but we have several, but we have a long iterated one that I'd started that Lara completed. But I think we could go at Rob's chat GPT. <laughs> I call him chat. Abbreviated. <laughs> Abbreviated version. It's, it's the synopsis <laughs> footnotes. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, who wants to tackle that one? I'll go for it. Okay. Akira is a groundbreaking Japanese animated cyberpunk film released in 1988, directed by Katsuhiro Otomo, adopted from his own manga series of the same name. Set in a dystopian version of Tokyo in the year uh, 2019, (laughs) the story unfolds in the aftermath of a catastrophic event known as the Tokyo Explosion, which triggered World War III. The narrative follows Kaneda and Tetsuo, two members of a motorcycle gang, as they become entangled in a web of government conspiracy, secret experiments, and supernatural powers. As Tetsuo develops uncontrollable psychic abilities, the film delves into themes of power, corruption, and consequences of unchecked ambition. Akira is celebrated for its stunning animation, complex narrative, and influential impact on both Japanese and global cinema, solidifying its status as a cult classic in the realm of science fiction and animation. I think the the last sentence actually does describe it to some degree of the reason why it's a cult classic. Correct. Yeah. I think it kind of brought the art of anime to America, too. I think this was one of the first popular animes to reach... American shores. They normally consider Akira like there's everything before Akira and everything after Akira. That mm-hmm. is true. And Akira was basically, you know, in what, in 88, which the 80s mm-hmm. is basically considered like the golden age of anime. Yes. So, and, then, and on top of that, yeah. we had the late 70s, early 80s, which we had a lot of us that were that grew up on the east coast uh, uh, coming from my end i remember battle of the planets do you remember that rob too because they they would actually we would have the americanized version it would be dubbed it would be a team that looked like birds you have white blue red the original the original title is called i think it's team gachaman or ninja gachaman something like that yep yeah so I, I used to love that show so much. I, I would come from school and I just had to plop myself in yeah. front of the TV to watch it all the time. And then after that would be like Robotech at that point. Oh, that was another one that I used to love too. Same here. And <laughs> yeah. those are the things that you would like go at the time in the early 80s when VCRs were a thing. 
that you would go and you say, hey, mom, I want to or dad, I want to rent a movie. And oh, it's like, all right, you're allowed one movie. And then you go through and you go through the animated version. You know, they would have an animated section for kids. But in that you would have these Jap- Japanese animated shows or VHSs. And that's what I would pick out. There was one that I was looking in particular that I remembered specifically, but I can't remember the name. And I was trying to look for it online through a IMDb database, but I couldn't find it. Uh, the only other thing I could find was probably maybe uh, M.D. Geist and uh, the Giver series, which they actually did put into a film adaptation with Mark Hamill in it and uh, other people. And they did two movies but the Giver, uh, I remember that. That was actually pretty good. Well, the anime is pretty good. <laughs> the the animated series, yes, that yeah. you could still find that everybody you could find it online. It, it's something I highly recommend too because I just like the idea of a battle suit. But uh, now we have more animation that's out there that's prevalent that everybody loves. And then obviously, uh, if uh, my friend Juanita were here, she would be talking everything animated that comes from japan because she just loves animation uh she's actually going uh she got press for uh some sort of japan animation convention that's uh coming up soon mm. and uh she would just love talking about this stuff but i remember princess mononoke and a whole bunch of other uh movies coming out after akira that uh kind of moved on with the whole uh japanese animation thing now this was my first impression when i first saw this i'm like oh my goodness there's a lot of ultra violence in this <laughs> and it's this particular movie for an animated japanese film the others weren't as prevalent but this one you had nudity you had blood you had extreme violence body horror yeah, literally. That's uh, what I do remember years, years later, the just body horror of, of Tetsuo. Yep. Yep. Very much. And uh, they wound up eventually doing something later on, years later. Uh, it, actually, within the 80s, it, it was still there. The movie, The Legend of Ricky. Ricky O. And that had extreme Japanese or Chinese. Uh, it was a mix. And that had visual effects that were very much body horror, which ja- Japan is mostly known for now. With uh, if you look stuff up online and you see some wacky stuff that's out there, that's Japanese horror based. Uh, <laughs> hmm. But uh, uh, this was very unique in it in itself. It was very innovative for its time. Uh, the animation, in my opinion, was done very well. As far as the dubbing was concerned, it was kind of slightly off when it comes to the English dubbing. But if you watch the the subtitled version, you're able to get a little bit more of the story. There's a lot more involved that uh, is kind of missing on the uh, English dub side. Well, the dubbing part, I mean, they they did it twice. One was in uh, 89 Mm -hmm. when they dubbed it. And then the other one was in 2001. So they're different actors. That's why when I watch the, the 2001 it's kind of off. T- I, I feel like it's a little off because I feel like the 89 one was a little better. Hmm. Uh, but I don't know for me. Uh, but I remember I saw the movie so much that I, re- I distinctly remember the voices back then. And I'm like, yeah, there's something off of this. <laughs> but yeah, no. I, but what I would say is um, Akira did something that was very interesting. One, it was, of course, a movie that defined Japanese animation, but also it was one of the costliest Japanese anime movies that Japan had at the time. And one of the things that it did very well was it was actually almost competing in the sense of, I would say, quality when it came to Disney at the time. So in some parts of the movie, uh, they are they're actually drawn at 24 frames a second, while other parts are on 18 frames a second. But normally animation is always drawn at around maybe anywhere from 10 to 15 frames a second. Yeah. Since you don't need that much motion. But yeah, with Akira, they went full blown. You know, that's why sometimes it looks really smooth and just very beautiful. Oh, yeah. um, In certain scenes. So it's it's just a phenomenal movie. And that's what defined, I think, for America, Japanese animation was Akira is where we started. Uh, Larry, your thoughts? 
<laughs> when you were talking about the shows you watched when you were younger, I think my first 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 exposure to Japanese animation was Voltron, which I think everyone watched <laughs> yeah. back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, that's the first one. But I saw Akira at my college, my university uh, theater. We had a theater on campus and they played a lot of indie and alternative stuff. So that was probably like 1990 or something. So it had been out for a little while, but that's where I first saw Akira. Mm. And um, I loved it. In fact, before that, even in high school, I'd go to like the animation festivals they'd have back then. That was the first time I ever saw like The Simpsons and Beavis and Butthead, all those like very underground, <laughs> cool, edgy cartoons ended up at those animation festivals. So I was excited to see Akira when it showed up at my college uh, university theater. And um, after that, I was just hooked on anime. I didn't get to watch it all the time, but I loved watching movies like Ghost in the Shell and Vampire Hunter D after that. Yep. And right now my daughter, who's 17, she is a huge anime fan. And I'd gotten out of it because, you know, mom and life stuff just gets in the way of getting to to watch things. But she's a fan of, she had me watch all of Attack on Titan with her, which is an amazing Japanese anime. Um, she's also into like Demon Slayer and My Hero Academia and all the real popular uh, animes that are out there for kids right now. So we're watching the the live action of Avatar. And I just enjoy sitting here watching their rip it apart <laughs> on Netflix. <laughs> we actually spoke about that last night when we had a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> but yeah, that was my first um, exposure to it. And I've always loved Japanese culture. My daughter, I can tell, is my daughter because she loves Japanese culture even more than I do. And I just love their rich culture of appreciating animation and anime as like not just for children, because I think when Akira came to America back in the 80s, you know, animation was just for kids. It wasn't considered something that adults had a, an appreciation for. And I mm. think Japanese animation... To this day, is still considered that way here in the United States. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're huge fans of Studio Ghibli and Hayao Miyazaki and his his movies in my opinion are works of art i mean they can be appreciated by all ages but you know they're they definitely aren't just relegated to children and right i just remember akira i hadn't seen it probably since i was in college so it was a good 30 years or so well i mean i think i watched it again one time with my husband um somewhere in our 20s or something like that but yeah i watched it again and i'm just like yeah the the animation looked a little bit dated to me, just considering what I see nowadays, but still a great story and just really well animated for its time. It's funny because I got exposed to Akira not when it first came out. Mm. I got exposed to Akira because of the bike from Canada. Yes. Uh, which is now one of the most famous bikes in the world. Uh, oh. And I saw that in a comic book shop. I saw this little tiny bike and I was like, that's the coolest looking bike. So I went inside and I asked about it. And so I bought it and I was mm -hmm. just very intrigued about it. So I kept asking about, you know, where did this bike come from? And it was like, oh, it's from the movie Akira. And so I went ahead and I said, all right, let me watch it. And I watched it through a VHS and I thought it was a very good movie. I was very impressed, but I was so confused. <laughs> and I'll admit, I was very confused and I was like, all right, something just, I mean, it's great, but I don't know. It's not what I expect from Japanese anime when it comes to action and stuff like that. Because, you know, again, you get used to Robotech, you get used to mm -hmm. um, uh, Battle of the Planets and things like that. And I thought it would just have more kind of a, what I would say, cookie cutter action. And then Epic Comics, which no longer exist came out with a series of the manga so what they did so in, of course as you guys know japanese manga is read from what is from right to left mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so what they did was they actually flipped it around and they colorized it so it was actually a beautiful it's a, like a beautiful series and instead and i think the original manga is like six volumes um this was like something like 30 different comic books because they just they took each <laughs> volume and they still you know they want to just make money out of it they added to it yeah. yeah but i got to read the entire manga and i finally understood what the whole story was about so if you really i mean the, 
the what's really I'm not, I'm not going to say bad, but what's missing about the movie Akira is that you are basically getting the first volume mm -hmm. and you're getting the last volume. And a lot of the middle stuff it's is kind of it's kind of just kind of glanced over in the middle. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with the actual manga itself, it could get a little confusing for especially for first time viewers of that movie. It's mm -hmm. a two hour movie, a little bit over two hours, like just a hair over. Right. And honestly, for those listeners that are out there, we are panels to pixel. So we love the idea that you actually go in and read the comic. So if you have any interest and you've watched this before, you could easily get the trade paperback online. Or yeah, if not, they you still go, sell this. Yeah. And you could still go to Comixology and they will have it available too as well. But my history with it as I was working in a recording studio and, uh, you know, I, I was talking to some kid that was interning at the time. And it was about 92 and we were talking about, you know, stuff we loved over our childhood, things of that nature. He was a little younger than I was, but he had mentioned Akira and I'm like, oh, what's so interesting about this? He goes, well, if you can find it, rent it. And I did. But I was, you know, I was still within the whole uh, Battle of the Planets, all into Voltron, all that stuff from the 80s that I knew. And then this was something he goes, no, this is a little bit more extreme. You're going to see a little bit more violence. You're going to see more adult oriented stuff. And I'm like, oh, Babes. kind of. Yeah, literally. Yeah, we do get a shot of those. But even still, it's not what the one thing I was looking for. But the thing was, is the fact is that it was a little bit more extreme of the violence within it. And that's kind of what attracted to me. And I said to him, I said, well, what are you talking about? Pretty much almost like the Dark Knight, Frank Miller, literally, because that's how Frank Miller and Watchmen came out in the mid 80s in comics. And that revolutionized the whole comic era at that point where people could be ultra violent at that point and i never thought that would happen in animation so i wound up renting it and watching it and going oh my goodness wow they could do this and uh it was very innovative by that time it was uh, had its cult status at that point and you, you could go to a convention and you could buy bootlegs and things of that nature so it, it's one that still set up uh, the one thing that always grasped me to it uh, was the iconic look of Kaneda walking to his bike. Like you said, Rob, that poster of him walking to it with the big pill thing on the back of his red jacket. And he's got a whole red suit. That is so symbolic of the movie in a sense that when they re-released it on uh, 4K Blu-ray and Blu-ray, that is the one image that they everybody attributes to akira when they see that they see the bike yeah it's either that or it's the uh bike slide which yes. has now also now come out i believe in two different movies the last one it was actually nope really um yeah so if you look at nope um kiki palmer is on her bike and she's going towards this is spoilers for those who haven't seen the movie, but uh, <laughs> she's going towards the rodeo and mm -hmm. she's going so fast. And all of a sudden she does a slide. Exactly. I mean, it was just like a frame to frame from the movie. I was, and it, and from later I read that, um, uh, Jordan, uh, uh, Jordan Peele. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Jordan Peele actually did that on purpose. He wanted to do kind of a tribute <laughs> to a pair. So oh, it was sweet. pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. There is reference to it in uh, certain movies, one of which that I do remember prominently within uh, Ready Player One, because mm -hmm. they used the bike within the movie itself during a racing event. And I right. think it's the, the, the bike that the girl is riding within uh, Ready Player One. Yeah, Artemis. Yep. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. And the fact that they utilize the same techniques and everything within that particular movie. So it's legendary in that sense that uh, it does influence more of pop culture or other movies or media at that point. So it, it shows that this is synonymous with uh, a cult classic. It is a cult classic. So, uh, but what I really did enjoy about the movie itself too is some of them. Th this this one repetitious percussive 
song or uh, music that's throughout it, which is part of its soundtrack, which right. I did enjoy. So I, I, I'm looking to see if I could find the soundtrack online, just like you normally do. Oh, well. I found it. I mean, I, I found it, and, and I've heard the whole thing, and it is a fantastic, fantastic soundtrack. What's interesting, because, yes, even though I did download it, I do own it. I just had, like, since I moved and I have a whole bunch of things in boxes, it is stuck somewhere where I don't know. <laughs> but I I do own the actual disc. Uh, but it is a fantastic, fantastic uh, soundtrack. It's nothing like you would hear. It, it, it definitely doesn't have, you know, the Americanized version of, you know, what a soundtrack would be. And it definitely has a lot of Japanese, old Japanese influences and in, different types of uh eras of japanese culture but fantastic it is just a fantastic soundtrack hmm. and apparently they they had some games based upon the movie itself too that i didn't know yeah tato uh, released uh, an akira adventure game for the famicon exclusively only in japan unfortunately <laughs> uh but another Akira game for the Jaguar and Super NES Genesis and Sega CD was being developed but canceled along with the prospects of another Akira title for the Game Boy and Game Gear and handheld consoles, according to Wikipedia. Uh, and Akira for Amiga and Amiga CD32 in 1994. To coincide with the DVD release in 2002, Bandai released Akira Psycho Ball, a pinball simulator for PlayStation 2. <laughs> so it's had its moments where they tried to do video games the movie itself has spawned some wanting it to be done in a uh, live action format the closest that we've gotten was uh, Taika Waititi who we all know from Thor Love and Thunder and Thor Ragnarok and uh, we do in the shadows what we do in the shadows yep uh, a wonderful man himself uh, a New Zealander a Kiwi and he uh, he was putting forward to it, but I guess the pandemic kind of ruined that. It was supposed to be in development by July and, and 2019 to come out in like 2021. But with the pandemic and everything, it just didn't happen. It's still in, uh, you know, uh, what I say is uh, <laughs> developmental hell like we always had. And as we've seen which has come out of developmental hell, which we'll talk about later in the news, is The Crow, <laughs> which Lara and I have covered here for 94, but we'll talk about that come news. But to get back to uh, what we're talking about, which is Akira, uh, within this particular movie, there are several moments in the movie that I do enjoy, but I want to know what you, what scenes did you enjoy? What moments did you enjoy within the movie? So we'll start with you, Lara. Did did you have any key moments within the movie that you enjoyed? First of all, I think the the eighties feel of it really got me nostalgic. They're all dressed in the very eighties clothing, kind of listening to eighties music um, at that school for delinquents that they're at. And probably one of my favorite scenes. I think all the scenes with the the children, the espers, the the little children with. Um, telekinetic and psych psych psychic powers uh, are always fun. So yes. when uh, when Tatsuo gets captured by the government and um, put in that room, his he, he actually starts tripping out because they've got the giant teddy bear and the the little car and everything, and they're using their powers to try to to get to him. That's probably one of my favorite uh, points in the movie. And then also the children at the end uh, speaking to Akira and their like connection to Akira and also trying to like use their powers to save uh, Kamita from all that's happening at the climax. So, so basically, I love I love those weird little children that look like old people with psychic powers. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Rob, did you have any? That you kind of that kind of stand out that you probably would recommend for people to uh, to enjoy. Yeah, I would say that it. the one of the one of the highlights of this movie is the beginning of the movie when there's the motorcycle gang fight. Yes, and 
they are riding their bikes throughout the entire city. And one of the most beautiful parts about it is that you actually see the trail of their taillights, just like you would see um, through high speed film. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they did that beautifully, I think, and the colors and everything are just fantastic. The music that they have going also uh, plays really well with those scenes. Those, I mean, like I said, those scenes just look phenomenal. And I think those all those scenes were actually filmed at 24 frames a second. That's why it looks really smooth and buttery. It just look it's just a fantastic, fantastic shot. Uh, the other parts that I liked were some of the subtle things. So like, Larry, you mentioned the teddy bear that was assembling in uh, Tetsuo's room. And one of the things I loved about that is the amount of detail that they put in the teddy bear, uh, you know, from all the materials that it was assembling. Uh, they really, really went all out on that. Mm. And plus, there's the scene, again, as everybody knows, this is a spoiler. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of spoilers here, but there's a scene where Tetsuo's arm gets lasered off. And what he does is he just he creates a cybernetic arm out of like just flesh and metal and all these things mm -hmm. and the amount of detail that you see like you see all the wires start to connect you see all the um pieces start to make like this artificial muscles and everything and i was like wow they really went all out when it comes to that uh so i, I you know me being an artist those are the things that I look for is those little details. Uh, even when uh, I would say, like, I remember the uh, one of the tanks you know, on the streets. Uh, one of the soldiers just sitting on top of the tank, but all the, the all the details on the tank, all the lines, everything on it. Yes, yeah, that's an I... artist. That's an artist that just did every bit of line and stuff like that. So I remember collecting a book that's on the art of Akira. And it has so many of those things in there that I was like, wow, uh, I really got to bring up my game when it comes to artwork, <laughs> the way they're doing things. But yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Those So those are the scenes that I like, are those type of scenes. And I like also the fact that Akira was one of the very few movies that try to stick to certain real scientific uh, things so one of them being when tetsuo goes up into orbit mm -hmm. if you notice when they do that scene there's hardly any sound whatsoever mm -hmm. because there is no sound in space so they that, that's what that was one of those things that i thought it was like oh that's a cool detail there and they respected that mm -hmm. and it just made it a lot more authentic so yeah those are my those are my takes on it <laughs> When you mentioned about the artwork and detail put into it, I really wonder if it's unique to Japan or if any other Japanese animation actually have the artist of the manga be the director of the film. That's a rare thing, isn't it? Because the fact that you had yeah. the actual creator all of a sudden became the director and and the art director and all that stuff, that, that's, what I think, what made it... Well, I mean, look, Japanese animation, depending on what it is, so like, if you look like a great example, if you look at like uh, Ghost in the Shell, Ghost in the mm -hmm. Shell is another beautifully done movie, but when you look at the artwork, and, and a lot of the things, even Macross, which is, um, what do they call it? Um, it's Robotech Macross. It's Robotech, yeah, so... When you look, I, I like I collect art books and I collect some of these Japanese animation uh, movies. And when you look at the detail, the amount of detail they put into things, it's insane compared to what American animated you know animation companies do, which is get it in, get it out, and do it at a, the cheapest budget you could possibly do it. So yeah, it's it's fantastic. I mean, I if I I would recommend anybody who's really into the that kind of artwork. Look at the behind the scenes artwork for a lot of these uh, animated movies and you will see so much beautiful detail that they do and the amount of work that they do and concept work that they do just to get one scene that probably comes out for like five seconds is incredible. It's the love and affection for the actual animation to pay tribute to the source material, I think. Right. And I, I think they wanted to get that across. And uh, like you, I noticed that too. That was the one thing I loved 
is uh, how textured it was with uh, certain scenes, especially with the the battle movement when uh, Tetsuo uh, was dealing with the army at that point, that whole big battle scene in the city. And then you could see it and they have like a kind of what would be a crane camera technique to come down. And then you do see right. the, uh, the whole thing of the tank. And I did enjoy that, but also in the length of what they did within uh, each character in certain scenes, whether it be within the bar scene in the very beginning all the way to um, the the cycle scenes and the battle scene at the very end between Tetsuo and uh, Kaneda. And yeah. I really enjoyed those. The one thing that I, I really did appreciate, because this is a Japanese-based uh, Japanese based anime, animation. Anime, like, uh, animation. So basically, uh, <clears throat> I liked how they, they have a sense of culture in it. And then how they were painting the whole thing about Akira in the streets and when the, the government comes in and then uh, the the people were talking about Akira itself. But the fact is, is that you have that Asian culture involvement in it. It's not set alone where it could be like, oh, yeah, it's based in Tokyo, because if you look at a lot of the characters, a lot of them are Asian based. But if you look at some of the characters, they look a lot of like Caucasian. And I don't know if it's something within the animators that were trying to integrate that to make it more universal. But it, it kind of worked in the sense of when they they showed the chanting, they had the the Japanese monks that were there. And right. They, yeah. And they were doing. And that. in I, the manga, in the manga, there's a lot more to that itself. I mean, there's huge sections that explains on why is it that Akira all of a sudden became like this deity uh, type of figure, uh, which the movie really didn't cover as much. Mm. But yeah, no, I, I, I think the, the thing is that like anime in the 80s did not really define itself. If you ever look at the anime that came out in the 80s, it does not have that typical, in, in some of the really good ones, it didn't have that typical look that it has now where, you know, it definitely looks like anime and it has the big eyes with all the, you know, all the reflections in the eyes and stuff like that. Um, Akira really didn't do that. Akira, you know, it's still a beautifully made movie, but things like Akira... Um, uh, Grave of the Far Fireflies, the Miyazaki movies, they never have the typical anime look, which is, you know, big heads, big eyes, little tiny mouth, uh, barely a nose, you know, that kind <laughs> of stuff. You know, um, it's just beautifully drawn in their own way. And some of that, and, and, and the great thing about anime in the 80s is that they they were experimenting a lot. And they were not really making anime for certain kind of groups or trying to appease anybody. They were just experimenting with things. And for them, it was working. So it, it's very interesting the way this movie and some other movies that came out during the 80s, when you watch them, you say to yourself, you know, um, very little. At the time, it was very advanced. But you could still appreciate them now because of that. Yeah, when you're talking about the um, the chanting and everything going on, uh, that to me, I haven't read the comics or the manga, so um, I kind of felt that that was indicative of a lot of the tropes of sort of 80s and even now dystopian films where there's obviously a fear of nuclear annihilation because of the bomb going off at the very beginning of the movie, but also this distrust of government organizations and the rise of religious zealotry and yes. just this whole abuse of uncontrollable power, you know, it, 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 this is a dystopian film. So it has a lot of those dystopian tropes to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the one thing people don't realize is that even though the movie is called Akira, the actual character of Akira really doesn't show up, except in some <laughs> scenes like, oh, yeah, that was Akira, you know, and they show like, you know, a kid or something. But 
in the manga, there is a huge section of, hey, there is a character named Akira, and he's there for almost the whole thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> and in the in the anime, that's why when when I saw it, I was like, so where is this Akira person? <laughs> it was kind <laughs> of, uh, if we look at the very end of the movie, it's all those test tubes that they found in the vault that was kind of right. all broken up. And it looked like vertebrae and brains and everything else. It was all mushed. But in the manga, he's not dissected. In the manga, he's just he, they just keep him in that freezer. Yeah. Because they're so afraid of the power that he has. So when he finally does break out, he breaks out. It's a little boy. Here, yeah. I remember it was like, wait a minute. That's a whole bunch of vials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have we to We do also... see Akira for just a few seconds at the end right when he's yes. speaking to the children yeah and you have to realize too the this is an adaptation so through adaptation we kind of lose a lot of what's in the original format which why is why i like to always reference everybody and the listeners to go to the original source material so i i just like the idea that you could actually read the source material appreciate for what it is if you if this was your first uh, introduction to it some people would love that and then read the source material and go oh i like the adaptation people have a mismatched kind of way of appreciating things i've known people where they've were only introduced to like the adaptation of something and then they read the source material and go i prefer the source material thank you and then i thank right. them and uh sometimes that just doesn't happen and you get the true purists that are out there saying Oh, I want to see uh, Marvel Secret Wars from 1984 be put on film and exactly as it was. It's not going to happen with the the way the MCU works. So uh, appreciate well, it happen, what you it have. It doesn't happen with a lot of you know um, properties that all of a sudden have to go into. Uh, what people don't realize is that when you have something with that's so rich, with so much detail, mm. and yet you're trying to put all that into a movie format or a limited, you know, run of eight episodes, you got to pick and choose the things that will make sense. Yeah. So I know, I know that Larry, you were talking about um, the last avatar and how, you know, your daughter was picking it apart. Uh, I saw, I remember when seeing the last avatar beautifully done. And when I saw the, the well, when I saw the M night Shyamalan, I think it was like, you know, an atrocious thing but <laughs> when this the the netflix one came out i was like okay you know what there's some things that it doesn't capture the way any animated movie does but the spirit of it is still there mm -hmm. um but there's a lot of people that they want exactly what they got from the cartoons and it's like that's going to be impossible to do yeah exactly. it's just you cannot do it especially because in cartooning a lot of the expression and a lot of the emotions are shown in the characters' faces in a very distorted way that makes sense. And for mm -hmm. a human being, you can't do that. And if you do, then it looks cartoony and stupid because now you got to, you know, do some kind of CGI version. <laughs> the best example of that is uh, The Lion King. So The Lion King, of course, you know, the, the Disney animated film, beautifully done, uh, very Cool character expressions, but then all of a sudden, when John Favreau did the Lion King live action, even though it made money, it was it felt soulless because the animals did not have that human expression the way you did in the film. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and so that's the problem. It's like sometimes, it's like, oh, we want what's on the on the yeah. cartoon or the anime and it's like when you put it into live action oh well it's not just it's garbage and all this stuff and it's like <laughs> what do you expect <laughs> i think the funniest but, thing about that is that um they tried to make the look almost identical to the cartoon so when you right. see some of the costumes and the wigs they almost look ridiculous because they look so much like the cartoons it just do. feels like uncanny valley <laughs> some people have actually described it as it just looks like a film with a whole bunch of people cosplaying 
Yes, that's exactly how we <laughs> felt about it. And I actually, I am not as obsessive about uh, The Last Air- Airbender as she is. So I am just enjoying it for what it is. But she's yeah. upset that they're combining two or three stories in one episode and you don't right. get the fleshed out version. And I'm like, well, if people want that, they should just go watch the cartoon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's why when uh when when I heard about you know oh they want to do Akira into live action, the first thing was I remember when Leon uh they were thinking about having Leonardo DiCaprio uh play either Tetsuo or Kaneda, and right away they started saying oh they're whitewashing Akira. Um, but you start thinking about it and it's like can it be done possibly because Akira is not a movie where um the characters seem way too out of, you know, out of the ordinary, you know, it, it's not like Ang where Ang's facial expressions and his childlike way of being, you know, really cool in the anime cannot translate very well to live action. I think with Akira, things can probably be done, you know, it's just trying to capture the spirit of that movie, which would be very hard or they would have to do something slightly different that can still work and hopefully translates the right way. It's like the same thing with Dune. People have always said Dune is an impossible uh, story to put on film. Well, they just made two films that, you know, are fantastic, you know, and they did change certain things, mm-hmm. but most of it is still there. So I don't know. It's something to, uh, to look after but yes like you said it's been in development hell for a long time and oh, yeah. who knows who knows what's going to happen well with, when you mentioned whitewash the first thing that i thought of and remembered was uh scarlett johansson and ghost in the shell from 2017 oh wow yeah <laughs> which i was going to bring up because the director who did that movie is doing the crow oh jeez <laughs> oh, of course <laughs> 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 Oh, uh, that movie. And and funny enough, like I, when I saw Ghost in the Shell, I was like, they got some scenes that were like just straight out of the anime, which was pretty cool. Yeah. But just Scarlett Johansson should have never played that part. No, they, they could have done something better. You know, we, we've had movies that were uh, post-apocalyptic or kind of cyberpunkian back in the day, if you remember Keanu Reeves with uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny Mnemonic. Mnemonic. <laughs> yep, I love that. That was a good way, but that was based upon a short story, I believe, uh, back in the day. And uh, I thought that was done well. Now, mind you, honestly, if you look at Keanu Reeves, he is Asian. So part Asian, part Asian. His father okay. is Hawaii- Japanese Hawaiian. Yeah, I, I knew you had a little bit of Samoan in him and uh japanese but, hawaiian not samoan <laughs> okay all right i gotta get it right sorry <laughs> i don't want to get blacklisted <laughs> it's not the same thing <laughs> <laughs> no but uh he has asian blood in him which is amazing and uh yeah, and uh, we wouldn't have uh john wick <laughs> but uh it worked out for that particular film and that became very popular and something that eventually i'll be covering on adrenaline cinema podcast uh because i i just love that whole cyberpunk element within that and we've had other films since then too. right uh the uh japanese animation has made its like like points in the world People there, it has its own following. Like I said, my friend Juanita follows this stuff online and she just watches this stuff religiously constantly. Uh, I I try to get her into podcasting. She doesn't do it, but she just tweets. And then she has her own little uh, journal that she does and uh, blogging. But now she's uh, going to a convention. But uh, the, it has its own following, just like uh, with my love for Godzilla that uh Rob laughs at because <laughs> it's all ja- uh, Toho and all that stuff. It's kind of gimmicky and it's kind of goofy. They were, they were, you know, there were some movies that worked. It's just that at some point it just looks very silly. It does. I, uh, I do know. agree. I do admit it. And that's the whole thing. It uh, And the whole point of my love and affection for that is literally because it just reminds me of my childhood. 
Of well, yeah, no, it. of course. But uh, yeah, uh, we we never really did cover Godzilla minus one, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I don't think we will. But I'll leave that up to Rob when he comes back with his podcast. <laughs> if he wants to do it. <laughs> well, like I said, I, I, you know, after watching it and criticizing it and then just hearing all the praises for it, I was like, what am I missing? What well, did I miss out of it? And I was like, well, I'm going to have to rewatch this again with fresh eyes just to see yeah. what it, because the fact that it won an well, Oscar for the best special effects when the creator, I think, had way better effects. <laughs> and the other contender there also was Ga- Guardians of the Galaxy 3. I'm like, no, no, well, no, 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 no. Yeah, we, we've discussed <laughs> this and even me yeah. saying it won for best effects what, for <laughs> yeah. Japanese effects because it was a low budget <laughs> film for Japan. And right. I'm like, when you told me, I was like, uh, I didn't watch the Oscars. So I'm like, OK, I don't understand that because yeah. I and I understand it for the fact of I know how low budgeted film the these Godzilla films are. So it's either A it was a hand to saying, hey, because you're a foreign film, you're Asian film, we're gonna hand this out to you, or uh maybe because of legacy and Godzilla never got an Academy Award. Oh. So maybe they I would, just be, care- I would be careful with what you're saying, because you're gonna have listeners saying, Oh, they ish- it deserved it. Are you saying that, you know? Honestly, uh, hey, 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 I'll say I did appreciate it for being a Godzilla fan. There were certain points that I did appreciate, but there's some stuff that I didn't like just along with Rob. But when we come to that conversation, we'll talk about that at that conversation. Yeah, you know, we will. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't but, seen it yet, so I still don't know. <laughs> uh, I would say check it out, but don't don't think of it as a don't masterpiece. Get my hopes up. Don't think of it as I a masterpiece. Say, I would say check it out and just give us your opinion afterwards because oh, yeah. don't be influenced by what any of us say. Um, it is one of the most different Godzilla's that they have ever made. Yes. And it probably does have so much, some, some of the most emotional and, you know, very well developed characters than any other ones ever made. I just felt that, there was certain little things that just little things that could have tweaked that probably would have made it better for me. Yeah, but that being said, I would say watch it and and just give us your opinion when you see it. Well, cool. yeah, my All whole right. family has enjoyed the Monarch series of monsters, but we haven't seen that one yet, so oh, I'm sure we'll like that's it. Re- that's good. It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Although uh, it, it it does do so, if you've seen all the uh, all the other Godzilla movies. Um, <laughs> You'll ask yourself, like, wait, there's certain things that you'll ask yourself, wait a minute, but that's not in the movies. <laughs> so I'm hoping that the new movie will answer some of, you know, some of the retconning that they did mm-hmm. through the, uh, I don't know if it's a retcon or they're going to come up with some kind of explanation. <laughs> or one off and it'll just be a one off movie right. like they did before. All right. I, I think we digress a little bit, but uh, let's go into like some interesting facts about the movie uh we could i i posted a bunch in our document but you could pick and choose what you will so lara have you were able to peruse the doc and find anything that you like that you, you could actually uh speak um, about let's see i'll choose this one This Japanese film was made in American style. When it comes to anime films, the Japanese studios usually prefer to draw first, then animate, and do the voice work after. However, Akira did things in reverse. Like many American animated films, the voice was done first, followed by the animation, the adding of the VFX and other special effects, and the final editing. Similarly, even the film's soundtrack was completed before the composers even read the script. As a result, parts of the music had to be edited to fit certain sequences in the film. Moreover, over 160,000 single pictures were used to create the animation, which was double or triple the norm of that time. Which kind of goes to what you said, Rob, that the the manga wasn't even finished before the film was finished. So right, they exactly. Put the cart before the horse. But it influenced the ending of the manga, which is like I said. So basically, the movie and the manga 
are really one entity. Not like, hey, the movie's a version of the manga. That is true, but the movie also inspired a lot of the things that happen towards the end of the manga, which the manga ended in the 19, I think in 1990, 91 or something like that. Hmm. Rob, is there anything in there that you would uh, choose? In here, there's something interesting about uh, one of the biker gangs in the film. Uh, so the jackets that they have has capsule, like capsules in the back, like the drawing of a capsule. Mm-hmm. And so the motto uh, on it says for good health and oh, and bad education, <laughs> which <laughs> I really like. Uh, but in it, when translated to Japanese, it forms a rhyming phrase as follows. Kenko ni yadusu, kaiko ni waridusu. So I guess the Japanese version of it is supposed to, you know, kind of rhyme, but the translation is still pretty cool, but it just doesn't rhyme. But it's just one of those little things where it's like, well, <laughs> different uh, different languages mean different things, but I kind of like that part of it. Hmm. Uh, the only thing I could take away would be uh the fact that it actually sneaks in some uh, references for Western culture. So as with other genres and like cyberpunk sci-fi films often refer to each other. And there's a special pleasure that comes from spotting all the references and connections, which we do within this movie. For instance, there's a scene where can I, uh, Canada is at the jukebox. And if you look very closely, you'll notice the logos of three popular rock bands, Led Zeppelin, The Doors and Cream. Plus, uh, Tetsuoso's uh, body was being scanned. The computer sounds that were produced in the background were, in fact, taken from Mother, computer from the sci-fi flick Alien from 1979. I thought this was an interesting one. Akira even predicted the Olympics correctly, because I went back and Googled when the Olympics were in Tokyo to see if it was around that time. It's not around the time of the movie was made, but it is around the time that the movie is set because it says it's always entertaining when a film or a television show unconsciously foreshadows or predicts an event in the future. When Akira correctly predicted that the 2020 Summer Olympics would be held in Tokyo, it blew a lot of people's minds. The film features scenes where there is a new Olympic stadium being built to host the games in Neo Tokyo. Well, at least we can be grateful that our Tokyo is nowhere near as dystopian as the one we saw on screen. So I thought that was interesting that the movie came out in the late 80s, but the Tokyo Olympics were hosted in 2020 and the film takes place. Um, I think the bombing takes place in 2019. Yeah, it was only off by a year. <laughs> Another thing that I, I just noted myself, I put it in my notes and didn't even mention it, is that I went to see when the movie was made, which was 1988. Mm -hmm. And there's scenes in there that completely reminded me, because I was a high schooler at the time that this happened, of the massacre in Tiananmen Square in China, where they yeah. attacked the student protesters with tanks and guns and everything like that. And it, that was very similar to one of the scenes in, in Akira. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. One of the things I thought was pretty cool is the fact that when you look at the aesthetics of it, uh, Blade Runner and Akira have a lot in common. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, again, just when you look at it, just that dystopian part of it, the way, you know, things have changed in the future. I mean, like, I know Blade Runner has more flying vehicles and things like that, and they have <laughs> replicants. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's it, it's still, you know, the cyberpunk look is still there. And I think... Well, I think uh, Blade Runner came out first, but somehow rubbed off on this film in, in a certain way, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And But my biggest thing was the fact that they George Lucas and Steven Spielberg did not think this movie could be marketable here in the United States. You know, <laughs> two people who have made science fiction movies, some of the best science fiction movies in the world, <laughs> even they thought, yeah, not going to work here. <laughs> uh. All right. Well, I think that's uh, about all we've discussed. Things that interested us, what we liked about the movie, interesting unknown facts. I guess we can move on to 
to kind of comic news or adaptation, comic adaptation news, because there's been a lot going on since we have not been podcasting. So uh, I want to talk about uh, things that have been going on in the MCU. So obviously uh, within the MCU, we know that Daredevil Reborn is back into production. And on top of that, we got Eldon Hansen and Deborah Ann Wall coming back as Foggy Nelson. And uh, Deborah is playing Karen Page again. So uh, we got the Netflix originals back for uh, Daredevil. And well, we- they had to do that. The fact that they actually try to start a series and did not include those characters. Yeah. I mean, that's why, you know, Kevin Feige went back in there and went, wait a minute, stop. <laughs> 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 what made this, what made it in Netflix really good? You're not going to do that. Yeah. You know, so yeah, no, I'm glad that they stopped it and they had to redo it again and include those characters in there. Yeah, they they had to retool and give us back what we wanted, which is the heart of the show. The original Netflix shows, those two were the the heartbeat of the show, in my opinion. And I think Charlie Cox actually mentioned that in an interview recently. Also in uh, MCU news, as we all know, Jonathan Majors is no longer Kang the Conqueror. He got fired and dismissed by Disney. So Kang is no longer the big bad according to uh, the MCU and what's going to be happening. We don't know because a lot of certain movies that were in play, Ironheart and things of that nature might be on the shelving committee. (laughs) It might be shelved completely where they, uh, whereas they're retooling and figuring out secret wars and uh, oncoming movies that are going out there. Uh, People that, could possibly replace Jonathan Majors as Kang because they would still need that particular character within the MCU with alternate versions. Coleman Domingo, who we all know from Fear of the Walking Dead, is a possible candidate. Now, mind you, he has dismissed it and he said his people were approached by Marvel, but he don't he has not confirmed yet or denied anything that uh, it was that particular character. So things are still out there. In the world, I personally can see him as that particular character if they do it with the African-American person. And I think he would give it a little bit more of a flair. But uh, who knows? And we'll we'll find out what happens. I'm still looking forward to the idea that we do get Dr. Doom. I'm, I'm looking for that to be the true baddie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe come. Well, I think they, they have no choice because Kang is... First of all, Kang is... I don't know what made them think that Kang would have been the great next thing after Thanos. (laughs) I just, I really (laughs) don't. Yeah, it's just like Thanos is really hard to beat, you know, and the only thing that could beat that are two other characters. It's either Beyonder. (laughs) No, uh, it's Doctor Doom or Galactus. Oh, okay. You know, those are the or Apocalypse done the right way. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Right you know, so, yeah. <laughs> so those are the only three characters that I could see there. It's like, okay, that can be a major event. But Kang? Mm. No. <laughs> and to continue on, uh principal production for Deadpool Wolverine or Wolverine Deadpool. I don't know exactly how they're wording it. That is finished. So they've done all physical and practical uh filming. So everything is leading up to our release. Coming in, I think, in what, July, Rob? I think so, something like that. But i tell you this much. I mean, that trailer was off the hook. Oh, it was. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, and I can't wait for us to cover it. But for the fact that he deadpans and gives, breaks the fourth wall, even in the <laughs> even in the trailer itself, saying it's like, uh, is Disney ready for this? <laughs> Being pegged. Uh, it's interesting, and I'm looking forward to it. We already know that they're all pushing for this R rating that's going out there. It would be the first official R-rated Disney Plus movie or Disney Plus Marvel film that's out there. But the thing is, is that uh, they kind of segued into that. And they stated recently that Echo was the first one that was on Disney Plus, which it wasn't. Honestly, if you listeners remember when Steve and I covered Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Hawkeye. Both were extremely violent for its time. 
and you still had to use your password to do and to access those particular shows. And I think they were ramping up and Echo is the the premiere at that point where they were trying to get to that. Echo was not that bad. I mean, it was a little violent, but Echo was still bad, a uh, bad, you know, Netflix uh, series. It wasn't that great. It was interesting. I haven't seen it, but I don't think anyone got their head slammed in a door until it decapitated them. Oh, that's yeah. true. But, you know, when you got uh, Wyatt <laughs> Russell smacking somebody with a shield and blood splattering on a captain america shield and <laughs> falcon and a winter soldier up in the screenshot that tells you right there yeah this ain't uh your regular marvel it's for kids disney level r yeah uh, like yeah I said, it, it's a little r it's, it's a, a little, little r but when as soon as like deadpool wolverine can comes into play into the theaters oh you know mr reynolds is gonna bring the filthy and when he well, does, yeah, I want well, to you, see yeah. It. I was gonna say you got to remember <laughs> the Deadpool movies are also very raunchy, yes, mm-hmm. uh, rated R kind of stuff. And I mean, some of the stuff you see, you you sit there, and you go, I can't believe they allowed him to do that. Yeah, you know. So the fact that you know, are they on Disney Plus? The Deadpool movies? No, yes, not yet. they are. They are. They okay. are, and they're on. <laughs> They're rated R, so you could watch them. You just have to put in that code. So if you're a, a family, you have to put in that code to watch oh. the R-rated version, like I did. Because my niece had messaged me. She goes, Uncle Mark, how do I have uh, access to this? Because she's on my account. Right. And I said, well, did you put in that you're over 18? She goes, oh, no. So she did, and she put in the thing. She goes, I have to put in this stupid code every time I want to watch these films. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> or lie about your age kid well, yeah well, well sure. when that first happened they asked you it's like okay do you want access all the time to rated r stuff and yeah. if you say yes you don't have to put in a code but if you you know but if you say no then i think that's when the code comes in for you know yeah so you can uh limit what your children actually watch <laughs> yep and Plus, uh, i think jessica jones is on there right yeah, Jessica There's Jones. There's a lot of sex going on in that. <laughs> Defenders. They kind of, they, supposedly, they kind of, in the very beginning when they first came out, when they moved the Netflix shows over, they kind of edited out certain things and people noticed. <laughs> and uh, me being one of a Blu-ray owner of Jessica Jones, the, the first two seasons, or actually all three seasons, and uh, Daredevil and Luke Cage. I looked into it and yeah, they did edit out and then later on they put them back in. So oh, okay. So they they went back and said, All right, well, we can't fool these people. But <laughs> I think it it's pretty cool for the fact, but that also this is also something coming from Rob and myself. That's why physical media comes really into play at this point. You I'm telling you <laughs> they, if you're a fan of movies, continue getting physical media. Yep. <laughs> That's what I say. Yeah, put them in business. But also, uh, to add on, we kind of hinted it at before, and Lara and I did cover The Crow 1994, right? Uh, on Panels to Pixels yeah, podcast. Yeah. Uh, it's coming up on, technically, it's on its 30th anniversary, if you think about it, Lara. But mm, now yeah. now we got uh, one of the Skaz gods actually playing the Riddler Oh, not Riddler, geez, the Joker version of <laughs> the crow. If you think about it, with <laughs> or the, the hot topic version, the crow. <laughs> well, it's so funny too. When the crow came out in 1994, guess what? Hot topic was doing, they were promoting the crow. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, if you recall. But uh, it worked in that sense, in the, in the fact that in 1994, doom, gloom metal bands were the big thing. Typo Negative was a huge gothic band at that time. Uh, you still had thrash metal and things of that. Uh, and even the cure was still relevant during on that particular soundtrack. So you had Pantera, the cure, the, the soundtrack for the original crow is, is synonymous with the actual movie. It's very legendary. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> Rob and I, and Frank and Adam and I were all talking last <laughs> night regarding this. Uh, it, it's a good movie, but is it, uh, the original 94 version, I still feel it. It was a good movie, good action movie, but it 
gained its success and popularity in a legacy through Brandon Lee's death. But was it true? And you and I had broached this about when we talked about the original 94 movie, about how it applied to the original source material, which was far darker and that we didn't get all that stuff. And now we're getting a scars guard. And I looked at it. I look at that trailer now and my attitude is like, okay, they're trying to recapture what they had in 94 with the scars guard kid. And Mm -hmm. what I really wanted. And when Momoa was really involved in it, I was hoping that we would get the psychotic Eric Draven who would cut his hands and everything else and go a little crazy. Uh, get that, uh, well, Do we me- still don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, you know how trailers are. Sometimes yeah. trailers don't give us a whole story. And sometimes they give us too much story. I'll watch it. and I'm anticipating to see what we get. But am I hopeful for it? Mm, <laughs> I'm not sure. And we will probably cover it because we already covered the original. Like I said, I still love the original for what it was based upon the whole look of it and the way they were able to achieve it, that was cinematic genius and how they were able to do that yeah. after he passed away. Honestly, he had like a, a his uh stunt man do all the work and then they just superimposed certain previous shot scenes mm-hmm. at that point. Well then and, after his death, because he was doing still a lot of the uh especially the fight scenes. Yes. Brandon yeah. Lee was doing those himself, but it was just after his death then they had to use a body double and yeah, do that. Yeah. But I, I'm but, looking forward to. But that that's something that came out recently, everybody. So we, we look forward to what your thoughts are too. So just let us know, and then when we cover it, you you could tell us your thoughts on the new particular film. We highly recommend that you go back and listen to our coverage when the original 1994 version of The Crow, and that was yeah. done. I would say what was two years ago that we did that. I think. I think if people haven't seen the original movie or or read the comic, they would probably like it. It feels a little John Wick as a goth kid to me. Not even a goth kid, kind of like a street kid. But yeah. I loved the 90s version so much because it captured that whole dark goth feel of the comic book. Yeah. Because that had a very dark gothic feel. And I was a goth girl <laughs> back in <laughs> high school. And so... um it was the 90s and it captured that whole dark grunge industrial feel in it. I yeah. don't think that this movie has that same feel, but that's not what is in the culture now. So maybe it's trying to capture the dark grittiness of 2024 as opposed to 1994. Yeah. Well, the whole goth movement, you know, has gone away so much that they have to now make it relatable to people whatever mm-hmm. group is out there whatever edgy group is out there right now yeah so i was telling i mean i was telling uh mark yesterday and i caught some slack for it because I, I was like <laughs> again i think it's a really good movie i enjoy watching it it has a really great soundtrack i think yeah but would that movie be as memorable as it was if it wasn't for brendan lee's death because if brendan lee was still alive it would just be another movie another B movie that got made and that's it. Mm -hmm. And people would have been like, Oh, okay. It's cool movie. But I think the whole thing with him dying on set, just like his father died on a set too. And everything made that movie much more of a big cult classic because of it. And, and of course it was his last work. So that's why people feel like, Oh, you know, it's, uh, it's heresy to, you know, try to do another movie without Brandon <laughs> Lee and stuff like that. It's like, first of all, the crow didn't belong to Dr- Brandon Lee. No, no. You know, no. that's not his creation. That so. was Obar's creation. But also, right. if, if you looked at Jason Momoa, he actually looked pretty cool as Eric Draven, I thought, when they were he in did, production. But he did, but he was doing it way too much like Brandon Lee. So yeah. Brandon Lee bought his own style to it and his own way of doing it. Um. I just think that, you know, they have to change with the times. But like we saw the trailer yesterday and as mm-hmm. we were watching it, if somebody said, hey, this is just a movie called, I don't know, something else. Mm-hmm. It w- it doesn't look like the crow. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. Right. So, but we'll I see. like Peter Skarsgård or not Peter. I like Bill Skarsgård. He's probably my favorite Skarsgård. Like I said, I'm going to watch it for his abs. 
<laughs> I mean, I I like him a lot. I've liked a lot of the stuff he's done in the past, and I like The Crow, so I'm going to hope it does well. I don't imagine it's going to be like the original one, but I'm still hoping it does well. Listen, I found out that there's eight scars guard. You know, I was like, wow, this guy did not stop. He has eight <laughs> children and all in the business, <laughs> so, which is crazy. So I was like, all right. <laughs> yeah, we, we went through a whole thing about that. That was so funny, too. Uh, the funny, too, as I, I was just looking up, I couldn't remember what I could have conceived of Jason Momoa other than Aquaman, too, because uh, did you guys see that? That came out, that came and went, but did Aquaman you guys? Aquaman, too? Yeah. Oh, I went to see it in the theaters, and why? <laughs> you know why? I tell you why. <laughs> because it was the last movie, it was the last uh, Zack Snyderverse movie. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I just wanted to see how it was going to, how, how much more in flames this thing was going to go. Yeah. Right, and it wasn't as bad as I thought. You know, it's not like uh, what was the one before that? Um, that wow. was just Justice League. No, the Snyderverse, and then it was something else. So, oh, oh no, well, no, they, Blue Beetle. What was a Flash, Blue Beetle, and then no. was there something else between Blue Beetle and uh, Aquaman? I can't remember. Did Shazam come in? Oh there yeah, somewhere? Shazam two. Uh, Shazam well, two. Well, Shazam two was in the beginning of the year. Yeah. Um, so that was absolutely horrible. Eh, the Flash was okay. I mean, uh, for that me, was it was Batman Part Two. Yeah, <laughs> there was segments of it that were really good, and then there are other segments that you're like, "No, it's bad." And then to me, Blue Beetle was actually a surprise. I mean, it's, it's yeah. unfortunate that it did not. At that point, people were just like, "Yeah, I'm not investing myself in this." But I wanted to see. I mean, it just seems like, you know, Jason Momoa just decided, listen, this is the last time I'm doing this. I'm just going to have fun with this guy. Yeah. And that's what he did. He just looked like he was having fun on set. He just like, I can't give a crap <laughs> how accurate this thing is or whatever it is. So, yeah, they're just waiting for him to come back. And 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 James Gunn saying, hey, do you want to be Lobo? Well, they already approached him about that. So. <laughs> it would be perfect for him to play Lobo, in my opinion. I think he is going to play because he did a video where he was just in talks. He was in talks with Warner Brothers. And as he was leaving the building, um, he was recording himself. And he just said, I just left Warner Brothers. And man, there's some surprises for you. And he started screaming and yelling, being happy and stuff like that. And everybody thinks it's like, yeah, he's going to be doing Lobo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's about it for news, but uh, I just want to keep all your listeners informed of what's going on. Yes, we took a break. Pedro Pedro Pascal is going to be Mr. Fantastic, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, we forgot about that, too. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, Fantastic Four has been cast as well. I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to a lot of the other projects coming out, but we will keep you apprised as we continue on. We took a little bit of a hiatus, a little bit of time, but a little over two and a half months since I put out a podcast. We started What If, didn't really finish it up at all, or even like, I think we got about three episodes in. But what we'll do is uh, what Jamie and I are going to be starting to be covering uh, Invincible next week. So check that out when it does. We're going to do that episodically every week. The new episode's out, so please send in feedback if you can. With Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, Lara and I will be doing an interview with a vampire, hopefully with our friend Rima and Danny, and we'll talk about the movie before in May when season two comes out on uh, AMC Plus, and then we're going to cover that episodically as well. So check that out. And then obviously X-Men 97 is coming out, so we'll be covering that as well, hopefully episodically. Just do a little shorts because it is a cartoon. Or animated, I should say, not cartoon. <laughs> uh, oh, we'll be covering that as well. Steve and I will probably do uh, a version of Echo, like our uh, just the whole season, just talk about the whole uh, series that came out for Echo and and in general, and what we think it will, how it will affect the MCU itself, and then beyond that, whatever comes our way as usual. So uh, keep in touch and let us know. But with that, to send in your feedback or where you could listen to us, we could be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast player of choice. 
You can find us on Facebook. All you have to do is look, uh, go to facebook.com forward slash panels to pixels. We can be found on YouTube. All you have to do is search for panels to pixels podcast. Don't just search for panels to pixels because you get Josh. And I know he's prettier than I am and has nicer hair. But uh, yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I do appreciate Josh and I love what his work is, too. But uh, follow us there. And if and. Uh, cue people into it because that's another way of t- to listen to the podcast as well uh we could be found on instagram at panels to pixels podcast or you could just email us panels to pixels one at gmail.com panels two is spelled out to pixels and the number one at gmail.com just send in your feedback that way uh you could text you know write a standard email or just record yourself and send it as an attachment you could be on here as well as uh somebody that you could be heard as well your voice so uh with that where can listeners hear you guys rob well you could listen to me on fantasy picks movie edition uh we've been on hiatus for a while we were supposed to be back like two weeks ago or something like that unfortunately uh oh fortunately and unfortunately you know life events got in the way one of them is that i've been trying to buy a house and i didn't realize how stressful and time consuming that could be uh, so much so that I just couldn't <laughs> devote time to the podcast because it's just been very consuming. Plus, you know, some other stuff. But we will be back and the format will change slightly, I say, for the better. And we'll finally, I think we're going to be on YouTube, which is going to be great for that. Um, and when we're talking about YouTube videos, so they'll be able to see my ugly mug and everybody else's ugly mug, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but so, But it should be fun. And for those who never heard the podcast, uh, what we do is we cover failed big budget movies that were overhyped and we try to make it better ourselves by giving our own take on it for that. And sometimes we will do a top five or top 10 on whatever movie genre, movie subject there is. And then we also started a section on honoring uh, movie composers. So and kind of, you know, sampling some of their some of their best uh, work that they have done yeah but that's it uh lyra obviously people could hear you on adrenaline cinema podcast when we come back for an interview with the vampire right mm-hmm. yeah you danny and i did a quick recap of season one we'll be back for the brad pitt tom cruise movie and then the second season episode by episode i don't usually do consistent podcast i usually guest podcast but you could go back and listen to steve and i cover the second uh season of the witcher and we never quite it quite got back to the third because nah. i couldn't find another partner <laughs> but maybe someday it'll happen yeah and on top of that you might be heard on when we do sandman cast on uh podcast when that comes back and jamie and i so uh because we're getting a second season on that as well so uh yeah you'll you'll hear a lot more from lara in time you know when she's able to come on and obviously for an interview with a vampire. So uh, obviously you could hear me here in Panels of Pixels podcast as always, and Adrenaline Cinema podcast as well, sometimes on Fantasy Picks Movie Edition, and uh, occasionally on Podcastica when I'm asked on. I think the last thing I did on Podcastica was the Buffy first podcast. Uh, I just love doing that, and I surprise Penny with my picks of when I come on every season that they do so i i only did uh the second and third season i'm waiting for the fourth to make my pick again i don't want to be a continual uh guest i i like to let other people join in and have the fun um and i am also a buffy fan too everybody i know it's kind of funny but it's it's fun uh but with that <laughs> that is our episode and i just want to thank everyone for listening i'm mark i'm lara and i'm rob Same podcast, different panel, different pixel. This was Panels to Pixels podcast, and we'll see you on the next panel. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.